Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Chase with Jace. I am your host, Jace Lejeune, uh, LSU beat writer for Granada Football. And again, for the second time this year on The Chase with Jace, I'm joined with Taylor Sharp of ESPN 104.5. Uh, does a lot of great stuff over there. Taylor, uh, another great time to be on the on the Chase with Jace and the old Episcopal broadcast crew uh, mm-hmm. reunites once again. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's it's better to be here now after the Tigers got a little win streak going. I mean, last time I think me and you were still crying over the USC loss. So yeah, uh, vibes are a lot better this time around. And that's perfect. You mentioned it. Like it, the vibes are a lot different since the last time we talked. And and I guess that's why I decided to have you on because it's like a different perspective, right? We we're talking about after the USC loss, how dim the Tiger season looked at the time, but now. LSU has riled off six straight wins since then and has won some pretty big games, especially the last two at home against Ole Miss, on the road against Arkansas. And this LSU football team is is really rolling right now, but so is the Texas A&M Aggies. And we'll, talk, we'll go into that a little bit more in detail later. But, but Taylor, uh, what do you have to say about really we finally watched an LSU game where you can just enjoy uh, the LSU game and don't have to really have to really sweat it out and uh, LSU um, before I mean it got a little, it was close early you know uh, but what weeks pretty much changed the complexion of this entire game uh, on the road yeah he really did and, and look the offense was great they, they were workmen like right I mean nothing nothing too crazy from Gary Nussmeyer no touchdown passes no turnovers he throws for around 230 to me it's all about the defense and yeah they only gave up 10 points I understand that I mean Taylor Green's been a little shaky Mm-hmm. To me, though, Jace, it's the rush defense. I mean, you know, we saw him get gashed a little bit against USC, a lot against Nichols, which was probably the most disheartening thing. And then even in the first half against South Carolina, but really since that first half of South Carolina, they, they've kind of, you know, a, a, a switch has flipped for him. I'll, I'll throw you a number right now, 199. That's how many yards rushing Arkansas was averaging per game. Yep. You held him to 38 yards rushing. Mm-hmm. Jaquindon Jackson – is a big time college running back. I mean, he he has done some great things at numerous stops. He's 26 yards rushing on five carries. I mean, yeah. you were phenomenal. Now, big reason why is because you were so efficient early in games on the offensive side, which you were down by 17 to South Carolina. You were down by 10 to Ole Miss. That was something we hadn't seen. So they were in that negative game script that they weren't able to run the ball, you know, as early and as often as they wanted to. But when they did, you completely shut them down. I mean, I think the I think the front seven of this defense to me has been the biggest, you know, positive surprise we've seen this year. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and these without really two of your biggest guys going into the year, losing them. I mean, Jacoby and Guillory out for the year. Harold Perkins out for the year. But this team has just risen this next man up mentality and really been the next guys up. They have really stepped up. We'll talk more about it. Uh, Offensively, you just mentioned Taylor. I think that paid a big reason why Arkansas only ran for only 30 yards on the ground, 38 to be precise, like you mentioned, was because they controlled the, the game. I mean, uh, like we're looking at it, and I think L- like Arkansas only had the ball, what, for eight plays, maybe in the, in the first quarter, if that. Uh, but LSU pretty much dominated the time of possession early on. And really the only thing that was – and I even said at halftime, the only thing that was slowing down this LSU team in the first half was the penalties. It was, it was the false starts. It was from the offensive line. There was some stuff with the receivers you saw as well, but LSU overcame that on the first drive with a Cam Durham, Cam Durham touchdown run. But LSU, I mean, from the beginning of that game, they, they looked like the better team and, and really controlled Mm -hmm. Arkansas from, from the beginning. Yeah, that, that's kind of the, the big thing for me. Take away the end of half, right, before half right, when it was like right. a two- to three-play drive. LSU had eight possessions. You came away with points on seven of those eight possessions. Mm-hmm. That's something we haven't seen in SEC play, whether it's South Carolina and you were off to the worst start anyone could possibly be off to. You dig yourself into a double-digit hole against Ole Miss. It was not the case in this game. I mean, you came out, and at the blink of an eye, you were up by double digits, and you really never looked back. I mean, I know at one point – you know, it's 13 to 7, and Arkansas has the ball. But I got to be honest, Jace, it never, you never felt threatened in that game. I mean, I get it. They had the ball only down six, but 
the way your offense started fast early and the way your defense was complimenting them on the other side, to me, it was like, yeah, they can technically take the lead on this drive, but I just, I don't expect that to happen. It was a really complete game. Right. And, and you mentioned it, like this whole game changed when you felt like Arkansas was in the game, you know, uh, they get a field goal and, uh, and 16 to 10, I believe at the time and Arkansas had a chance maybe to get down the field and take the lead. But that's when Whit, Whit Weeks decided to really go and to his uh, tired Matthew hunting badger impersonation and tip the ball up in the air and intercept and he intercepts it off the tip from himself and that's up the touchdown. It was like interception, touchdown, two point conversion, boom, boom, boom. And I mean, it felt like it was the end uh, for Arkansas that at that sequence of events. Yeah, because you would you would just scored and then the one time you punt, you pin on the inside the 10 yard line. Mm -hmm. And then a few plays later the the Whit Weeks tipped interception happens. And then you score two plays later. So the punt almost didn't count. I mean, it was almost like a deep pass to the 10-yard line. Right. You get the turnover two plays later, you score. So it's like you technically punted, but you scored three plays later after that punt because of the turnovers you, you mentioned. And then, you know, a guy I want to highlight that people aren't mentioning, and I always say this, you know this when we uh, do Episcopal broadcast together, if you play defensive back or mm -hmm. offensive line, and people forget that you're playing, you're right. in a heck of a game. I have multiple yep. people texting me in the second quarter, why yep. is Zai Alexander not playing? I mean, I'm pausing my TV looking for number 14. I'm like, no, he is playing. He's just he's out playing. there on an island completely shutting everybody mm -hmm. down. They're not looking his way. Yeah. Having a guy like that back to me is, is one of the bigger things on this defense. I mean, you mentioned the losses that are obviously big, whether it's Jacoby and Guillory, whether it's Harold Perkins, but – Think about the first few games of the year, right? I mean, you had Zion Alexander back for South Carolina, but, you know, Nichols, Southern Cal, it, it's really the Sage Ryan effect, if you will. Yeah. Because when Sage Ryan got here, you know, he was a highly touted guy, but he had never played the safety position. I mean, he came in and pretty much instantly took over the nickel spot. And then for the last year and a half out of necessity, he said to play that outside corner position. Getting a guy like Zion Alexander back next to an Ashton yeah. Stamps, who's really had a good year as well, that allows Sage Ryan to go back to that normal spot and then has Major Burns in that star position. Yeah. I think Sage Ryan and Major Burns, for Zion Alexander to come back under this new Blake Baker scheme, I think those two maybe have benefited more than anybody else on this team. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you, and you're right. I mean, Zion Alexander was really the missing piece to the puzzle because that way you, you can have Sage play safety and he feels – Pretty comfortable. He looks really comfortable back there playing safety. And then Major Burns. I mean, he looks he looks really good at the star position. So it was just having that consistent piece at cornerback was going to be the case. And Zion Alexander has really become an underrated part of this defense. And Brian Kelly, for the longest longest time, Taylor, he was talking to really the media about playing complimentary football. Complimentary football. Well, when I wrote the post game article about this game. It was like this was the most complimentary games I've ever seen under Brian Kelly. Uh, when you're three big, basically the three biggest MVPs of that of that game against Arkansas was Caden Durham offensively. He had 100 yards rushing and three touchdowns. Whit Weeks, we saw him make that interception, and we was all over the football field. Ten tackles, a sack, interception, all over the place. And then Damian Ramos as well on special teams with so the four field goals and. Him making all those field goals really helped to stay just that step ahead of Arkansas when it still was a game. And it puts you, I believe, 16 to 7 at halftime. But Damian Ramos is another guy. You're talking about Zy Alexander, uh, about, you know, not talking about him enough. But I thought Damian Ramos, he deserves a lot of praise from how consistent he has really been at the kicker position. Yeah, because look, as good as this offense has been, Jace, every offense has you know, some sort of weakness. Now it's up to the defenses to find that weakness and capitalize over it. For LSU, it might be scoring inside the red zone. I mean, that, yeah. that that's kind of the, the big area. Now, Trey Des Green, who I'm sure we'll get to, is probably going to change things there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, scoring in the red zone has been an issue for him. But when you have such a solid field goal kicker like Damian Ramos to fall back on, you don't have to be uber aggressive, right? You don't have to mm -hmm. tell Nelsmeyer, hey, we have to take a shot at the end zone to convert here because you have the field goal in your back pocket. I mean, to have an offense as efficient as LSU with the kicking game of Damian Ramos, I mean, it, it makes you almost impossible to stop on a down-in, down-out basis. At the beginning of the season, Taylor, when we are talking about USC and knowing how this team would look, 
did, would you have ever thought on the road in the SEC, regardless who you're playing, regardless, that LSU would handle business, win by 24 points, and Garrett Nussmeyer did not throw a touchdown pass? So like, would you ever thought that would happen? No, no, absolutely not, because – at the beginning of the year, I didn't have confidence in this defense. You know, what I mean, that's the that's the big thing. In the first two or three weeks of the season, it was a little bit more of the same. Now, obviously, you saw, hey, these guys are at least in the right positions. They're they're getting better, but it's where you want it to be. I mean, the defense has gotten where they needed to get at probably the perfect time during this season. Because again, I mentioned it, Arkansas runs for 200 yards a game. You saw them down for 38 yards. Ole Miss, they run the ball really well. By and large, you shut them down as well. That's perfect for the matchup you have coming up because Texas A&M is a team that also likes to run the ball. But Ole Miss and Arkansas were kind of the appetizers, if you will, getting you ready for this big-time matchup you have coming up. So I think everything's kind of lined up perfectly for them. You know, you struggle early on, and as much as you hate to look back and say, man, LSU should have beat USC, they're the better team. I mean, USC has four losses now. You can say, okay, they were the better team. They let one slip. Imagine where this team would be right now. They would probably be the number one team in the country if they didn't lose to Southern Cal. However, sometimes a loss early in the season like that helps you learn who you are. I mean, when Ole Miss came into the game, you know, they had had a loss, but it wasn't on that big stage. It wasn't week right. one. They didn't have time to fix it. And, you know, you had worked out your kinks a lot longer than Ole Miss had. I mean, that's what makes this this game coming up this Saturday so intriguing. You're in a top 15 matchup on national TV. You lose a very close game. Texas A&M did the exact same thing with Notre yeah. Dame. I mean, their, yeah. their first loss is an out-of-conference game week one. Both of these teams so similar in, in what mm. their season has become right up until that point. So as much as you hate to say, man, LSU should have beat USC, which they absolutely should have, it maybe worked out for the better because a lot of times, you know, if you squeak by that game, it's almost like, oh, we're letting some of our bad habits slide. You know, we, no need to fix them. We're still undefeated. We're we're good. We'll worry about it when we get there. You were able to get that out of the way early, and I get it. You're playing behind the eight ball so much. It's like you almost have to play mistake-free football, but a loss early in the season really can help you. Yeah, yeah it has. And, and Brian Kelly says you learn a lot about your team when you're playing somebody like that first game of the year. Uh, and then what Ole Miss did was play like a whole month, month and a half without really playing anybody and not really having a, a really general idea of how this team can overcome adversity. And LSU has done it multiple times this year, whether it was not only the loss to USC, but on the road early against South Carolina, finding a way to, to win that football game. I felt like that South Carolina game too has really helped this team really grow uh, and really put them in a position where they can be battle-tested and win those games against Ole Miss. Now let's talk about uh, the Texas A&M game coming up, Taylor, because like you said, like it, we didn't expect LSU A&M to be for the top spot in the SEC. Like, I, I don't know how many people would have had money on, on that being the game for the top spot in the SEC, but really both teams, I think even still with a loss, no, I think no matter who really loses here, uh, is still in position for a playoff spot. I really do believe that. But whoever wins this game, Taylor, it they're going to set themselves pretty good when it comes to a college football playoff spot down the road. Yeah, especially if you're LSU, right? Because you got your your first three SEC games out of the way. You know the the back to back to back SEC games unblemished, and and you go on the road to Kyle Field in a place where you have struggled to win in, in recent years. You get those three out of the way, Ole Miss, Arkansas, Texas A&M, two of those being on the road, you feel really good about where you're at because you're on a bye week, and I get it. Alabama's Alabama. They have a lot of talent. They're not the Alabama of old. I mean, anybody mm -hmm. who's watched them this year because, yeah, they had the big win against Georgia where they got out to such an early lead, but after that, they gave up 40 points to Vanderbilt in a loss. They beat South Carolina by one, which if Lenora Sellers makes a wide-open two-point conversion throw that I possibly could have completed, they lose that game to South Carolina, and then they lose last week to Tennessee in a game that Tennessee really controlled from start to finish. So if you're LSU and you beat Texas A&M, you have two weeks to prepare for an Alabama team who I don't believe can match you point for point mm -hmm. offensively. You feel really good about where you're at because you look at the remainder of your schedule, right? 
you you dodge Auburn, unfortunately, because they're a very bad team. You have Vanderbilt. That's a dicier game now than what you thought it was going to be at the beginning of the year. But a game that looks like a lot easier than at the beginning of the year is Oklahoma, who can't find anything offensively. So it's like Vanderbilt got a little tougher. I think Oklahoma got a lot easier. So if you can get past that Alabama game, you got to feel really good about your chances of running the table against a Florida, Vanderbilt, and Oklahoma. Yeah, it's just, especially it's just like these. this next two or three weeks is going to be crucial for LSU. Now, the good thing about it is, and I haven't seen many years where it's like this, but LSU will have another bye <laughs> after the A&M game. So that is going to be more of a, of a time during this bye week where you can focus on kind of the bumps and bruises and just heal up where – uh, in comparison to the first bye week, that's more of like, all right, let's get our guys up to speed. Some of our younger guys up to speed on things. Some of our older guys up to speed on things. It's a learning opportunity because you're pretty early in the season, so you can learn on that. Now it's more of like, okay, let's just heal up and uh, get ready for for the back stretch of the SEC. So let's talk a little bit about this A&M game. A lot of uh, similarities on, on paper. Uh, both teams, like you said, Taylor, or coming off, I mean, six straight wins, but they also dropped that first game of the of the season, uh, Texas A and M to Notre Dame, and then LSU, of course, to USC. But even though uh, really both these two teams play each other and familiar with each other, so are the coaches. Even though Mike Elko is a first year head coach at Texas A and M, I even asked Brian Kelly about this on Monday <laughs> about his relationship with Mike Elko and that he was his former defensive coordinator at Notre Dame. So both these two guys really know a lot about each other. And Brian mm-hmm. Kelly says, well, I mean, uh, to make myself look smart, I got to hire an Ivy League guy. Uh, and so that's what he did with Mike Elko. But this should be a really good chess match uh, between uh, Joe Sloan and the mm-hmm. offensive coordinator against uh, Mike Elko and their defensive staff at Texas A&M. To me, that's going to be an interesting chess match, knowing how LSU's offensive line is one of the best in the entire country, and Texas A&M's defensive line is one of the best in the entire country. Yeah, you know, that to me, again, that that is the matchup, the LSU offense versus the Texas A&M defense, because, frankly, I don't think Texas A&M's offense is very good at mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. Jace, maybe it's my fandom creeping in a little bit. Maybe it's my bias. I, I can't find where Texas A&M is significantly better than you now. They mm-hmm. have the advantage on the defensive line. Mm-hmm. But your offensive line has been so good. I mean, you were battle tested there. Arkansas with Landon Jackson was yep. supposed to have a good pass rush. They couldn't get to Garrett Nussmeyer. Ole Miss was supposed to have one of the best D lines in the conference. Mm-hmm. Garrett Nussmeyer threw the ball 52 times in that game. No sacks. You yep. gave up zero sacks and two and a half tackles for a loss in the past two games combined. You go all the way back to the South Carolina game. Now, they, they were able to get two sacks. I think their defensive line's a little bit better than Texas A&M's. Coming into the season, I would not – have probably said that, but kind of watching how the season unfolds, I do believe that. But it hadn't mattered because while they rattled Garrett Nosmeyer a little bit, he's been so good late in games. I mean, you know, we're talking about the Ole Miss game, right? And, you know, he had to have a third and 10. He converted. He had to have a fourth down. He converted. And then his second fourth down of that last drive was the touchdown pass right. to Aaron Anderson descended into overtime. But Go look at South Carolina as well. I mean, LSU's yeah. trailing in that game. And what does Garrett Nelsmeyer do when the game's on the line? He marches you right down the field, and he gets gets the ball in the end zone. And that's that's ultimately what helped you take the lead in that game. I mean, he's he's done this multiple times this year. Yeah, I get it. We love the Ole Miss game because it was in front of your home crowd. It was a night game. It was prime time. But that's not the only time we've seen Nussmeyer do this. Yeah, Both of those teams, South Carolina and Ole Miss, probably have better secondaries than A&M. The key right. to the game for me, if you can keep Nussmeyer upright, mm-hmm. that secondary of Texas A&M is not great. Now, on the flip side of things, they probably have a little bit of a better running game from a, a guy that we know very well, Le'Veon Moss. Moss yep. But on the flip side of things, LSU has the better offensive line. And Caden Durham is no slouch either. I mean, Caden Durham did last week what no freshman at LSU has done since 1995, 100 yards rushing and three touchdowns in the same game. I mean, he has been a godsend to that backfield offensively. So, I mean, Jason, while these teams have been so similar, while their paths to this point have been so similar, I really like the Tigers in this game because I Mm -hmm. can't, I I can't in good conscience say that Texas A&M is better than Ole Miss. And, you know, you were able to get past that hurdle. Do I feel as good about it as the Arkansas game? No, but if you can stop the run, which LSU has done really well in recent weeks, I'll give you the Connor Wagman stats right here. Kind of 
kind of game by game because I have them right in front of me now. You know, they play Notre Dame. What was Notre Dame able to do? They were able to stop the run. You forced yep. Connor Wegman to throw the ball 30 times. He goes 12 of 30, no touchdowns, two interceptions. Yeah. The following week, he only threw it 14 times. He mm-hmm. went 11 of 14, two touchdowns. Mm-hmm. What happened against Missouri? 22 times, 18 of 22, but last week, 15 of 25. Yeah. For another in a, a touchdown, but also another two interceptions. He's not a volume thrower. If you mm-hmm. can get ahead in this game, win on first and second down by stopping the run and force Wegman to throw the ball in third and long situations, I think I like LSU's chances because he hasn't shown the ability to do that so far. Right. And the pass rush for this LSU defense, I mean, you pin your ears back and it's third down and long. You put them behind the chains. You put Le'Veon Moss out of the football game because he's the one that really scares you defensively for LSU. If you force Kyle Webman to beat you with the pass rush, and the way Brandon Swinson has been playing, the way what Weeks has been playing, you see Major Burns come off the edge, you see these DBs in off the edge, it, it could be a scary thing for Texas A&M. Now, for LSU, um, I agree with you. I don't think really A&M has a big advantage over LSU in any particular category, but knowing that some of the – I guess the one thing you, that scares you if you're an LSU fan is a lot of the, the penalties, the false starts, a lot of those pre-snap penalties, and you're going to an even, you can say, even more uh, rambunctious atmosphere in Texas A&M with the 12th man and how loud it can get there. Uh, hopefully, if you're LSU on the, on the road, that you can avoid some of those mistakes that really – it didn't really cost you in the end, but it could cost you here. Uh, on the road uh, in College Station. Yeah, and, and that goes back to my point about winning first and second down, right? That that goes both ways. You want to be able to run the ball on third and short. You want to make Texas A&M throw the ball in third and long. LSU did a really good job of this against Ole Miss, and, and that's that's the key to beating and stopping a Lane Kiffin offense, right? Lane Kiffin's such a good play caller, but if you make him more predictable in those third and long situations like LSU did – it's a lot easier to defend a guy like that. The physicality of LSU really got to him. I thought they took a little bit of a step back, to your point, in terms of in terms of penalty. Seven false starts in the first half. And, mm-hmm. Jace, I have been counting every single game. And if I'm correct, every game but one, Will Campbell has had at least one false start penalty. Mm-hmm. He had two against South Carolina. He had two against USC. Mm-hmm. That's something you have to fix. Yeah. I mean, Ole Miss was the only game he did not have one. That's been your biggest game so far, but you can't have that. Three snap infractions from DJ Chester. Yep. That cannot happen. You think Arkansas was loud? Kyle Field is going to be way louder mm-hmm. on Saturday. You cannot have that because as good as Garrett Nussmeyer has been, the running game for LSU has opened everything up, right? Because if you're in second and 15, third and 15, Texas A&M is going to send five or six guys. I mean, we know how good of a defensive mind Mike Elko is. You have to stay ahead of the chains, and part of that's cleaning up the penalties. Yeah, that, that's going to be uh, key for this week for LSU. And I, I know uh, I think my buddy Bryce Kuhn uh, tweeted this out about like LSU is already working on on the noise and like cranking up to eleven. They can get it up to that high uh, with the music in the background. So LSU is getting ready for for that and having a road game against Arkansas. I think really helps them here getting that that mindset of playing on the road and us versus them mentality, right, us against the world. So let's see how that helps them this week against Texas A&M. Uh, Garrett Nussmeyer, uh, now he didn't throw – like I know he came into the Texas a- – uh, to the Arkansas game, leading the SEC in touchdown passes. He didn't throw one against, uh, against Arkansas, but I thought he played a pretty clean game for the most part. He didn't turn the football over. I don't think really forced many uh, passes that could have been intercepted. And he was just play, he played clean. Uh, he converted on a couple third downs, and he did. And he and he was uh, really clicking on the underneath passing game. Him and CJ Daniels are really clicking as well throughout that throughout that game. So, and that's what you need from from your quarterback. And I thought Garrett Nussmeyer played a pretty solid game against Arkansas. I am so glad you mentioned him because I was just about to bring him up. You're talking about the short passing game. The impact that C.J. Daniels has made on this offense kind of goes under the radar a little bit, right? Because you talk about Mason Taylor in the short underneath stuff because he's been here for three years. We know about what Kyron Lacey and Aaron Anderson can do down the field. C.J. Daniels is a big target, and he attacks the football. I mean, he does not wait for the ball to come down. You saw a few times last game. I mean, he is beating DBs to the spot where that ball is. 
he adds another element to this offense that you hadn't really had because he's been in and out of the lineup because of injury. You know, he's worked on his chemistry. I thought last game was probably the best game he's had as an LSU Tiger. I think he's going to be big in this A&M game. I'm glad you brought him up because I think his impact has been understated. Yeah, he's really been a key piece of this offense, and that way it gives you that that other possession reliable receiver for for Garrett Nussmeyer. And speaking of a guy that can become that is a guy you alluded to earlier in the show, and that's Trey Dez Green. And we saw him get a lot of snaps in the game against Arkansas on the road, caught a two-point conversion. Like, whenever his number's been called upon, it hasn't been much this year. But whenever his number's been called upon, it's been pretty good. A two-point conversion against Arkansas, the touchdown against Ole Miss. He called another one to start the year. I believe I was against uh, Nichols to start the year as well. So uh, LSU getting him more involved in the slot. And if you have a guy that's that big, a guy that, that we've covered a lot back in high school, a guy that's that big, six foot seven, like 240 pounds, like I don't know who can cover a guy like that in the slot. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody, Jason. To your point, he's made the most of his opportunities coming into the Arkansas game. He had three catches on the year, two of them for touchdowns. So yeah. not a bad percentage. And, you know, anybody who didn't watch the game, you're going to look at the box score and go, ah, what are you guys talking about? A guy who had one catch for eight yards for it. That's not counting the two-point conversion, mm-hmm. which that was literally Garrett Nelsmeyer saying, my guy's taller and can jump higher than your guy. I'm going to throw it up to him and let him make a play. But – you know, Jason, the Ole Miss game, he played less than 12 snaps. I don't know the exact number, but I believe it was somewhere in the single digits. Last week, 81 snaps for LSU. Trades Green was on the field for 42 of them. Yep. That's huge to me because, again, did he have the big impact in terms of the stat sheet? No, he didn't, but he's a much improved blocker on the edge. He blocked a lot better than I thought he would last game in his first extended action. And the more he's out there, the more familiarity he has with this offense, the more comfortable he gets with Garrett Nelsmeyer. The more we're going to see of him, and I mean, you mentioned it, six foot seven, a matchup nightmare. The sky's the limit for this guy. I'm excited to see what he can do, not just on Saturday against Texas A&M, but as the season goes along. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's going to be a future star, that's for sure, uh, as an LSU Tiger. It's going to be really cool to see him wear the purple and gold for the next couple of years. Uh, but, yeah, LSU is going to be on the road against Texas A&M. Not a great slate, I mean, in college football across the country this week. It's been kind of one of those – uh, week by week, like we get a huge week of college football, and then maybe get not so uh, a great good week. But this is pretty much the headliner, really. Uh, LSU, A and M for the number one spot in the SEC. Taylor, with that being said, who you got on Saturday? Who's going to come uh, come on top and be on top of the SEC standings when it's all said and done? Again, I I, I don't like going into games being too confident, but I got I got the Tigers in this game, Jays, because again. As improved as your defense is, I think you're going to completely shut down the Texas A&M offense. I think your offense is a little too good to be shut down by their defense. And I'm going to give their defense their due. This is one of the Mm -hmm. tougher defenses you've played all year long. But you look at South Carolina. I mean, how good was their defense? Put up 38 points. How good was the Ole Miss defense? You put up 29. You just put up 37 against the good Arkansas defense. So far this year, it has not mattered. And then you go look at Texas A&M. They've struggled to put up points consistently. I mean, that's, you know, you go look at at Connor Wegman's passing totals. It's the games as a whole, right? I mean, 13 points against Notre Dame. You get, you score, now you score 41 against Missouri, whose defense has taken a big step back. And then a 34-24 win over Mississippi State. But Connor Wegman was shaky in both of those games. And I think LSU, at this point in the season, may actually have better defenses in both of those teams. And Mm -hmm. so far this year, it has not mattered which offense LSU's played. So for that reason, I'm going with the Tigers. Yeah, and uh, even though that Texas A&M's front seven has been really good, I mean, their secondary has been uh, not as good. So, like like you mentioned, if if LSU's offensive line, of course, I'm going to write a game preview about this on BernardFootballUSA.com, but if LSU's offensive line able to hold uh, and really hold the pass rush for Texas A&M, what they've been able to really do all year long, then I feel like LSU is going to take care of business as well. But that's going to be the biggest key for me. Taylor, uh, enjoy this one on Saturday. It's going to be a really fun one between LSU and the A&M. And it's crazy how how the season can turn. I mean, the last time that we talked, uh, we didn't know what the season was going to be like. LSU coming off a loss against USC. Now you're talking about LSU being in the top ten and having a chance to be number one in the SEC. 
if they were able to pull off this win on the road against AM. Yeah, I'm excited about it. And you know, Jace, I actually have a lot to lose in this game as well. This is not an official bet, okay? So okay. do not hold me to this because okay. it's not going to happen. But <laughs> T-Bob Hebert has been trying to bully me and get me to dress up as a yell leader if LSU loses. I'm okay. not doing it. I haven't agreed to this, but <laughs> I can't take the chirping in my ear all week long if LSU happens to lose this game. So the Tigers need to get it done for me if no other reason. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, just for Taylor's sake. Uh, LSU just get it done and uh, move on. And I uh, head to the bye week at uh, number one and the SEC. I appreciate you for joining with me, Taylor. We'll catch up maybe uh, one more time, maybe by the end of the year, and then I guess I will see you on Friday to call some Episcopal Knights football action. Yeah, absolutely, man. You know, our guy Reed Chauvin, six touchdowns last week. I'm excited to see what he can do as an encore. Absolutely, Taylor. Sounds good, man. Appreciate you, and uh, thank y'all guys for watching. Make sure to go to our website, gridironfootballusa.com for all of our LSU content. I just put a piece up about Whit Weeks and how he's just been rejuvenating this LSU defense and bringing that energy and swagger back uh, to this LSU prideful defense. So uh, check that out, gridironfootballusa.com. Check out all our stuff at gridironfootballusa.com as well. Subscribe to our, our YouTube channel too. And guys, we'll uh, check you all next time on their edition of The Chase with Jace.